Minecraft shaders. There's a lot of them, but there's one key feature that separates most of them from the vanilla Minecraft lighting. Shadows. In most of the fancy shaders, the blocks will cast shadows based on the position of the sun, while in normal Minecraft, you would just get shadows when blocks are directly above other blocks. Newer versions of the game will blur the shadows to make them more realistic, but if you look at the alpha version of the game, it's very obvious what's going on here. The interesting thing is that making realistic shadows is easier than you'd think. Even those of you without programming experience can easily understand the concept, and those of you with programming experience may end up wanting to try to code it yourself, since it's quite fun. Long story short, I'm doing that thing you're not supposed to do as a game developer where you make an online multiplayer open world action RPG sandbox game with a custom game engine made from scratch in Python as a solo developer. Will I finish it? Who knows, but I already have a working networking framework and my rendering engine is what led to this video. To start with, I set up the world geometry in a similar way to Minecraft. The world is split into chunks and I combine all of the blocks into a single chunk to remove hidden faces and create a vertex array in modern GL which the GPU sees as a single object. Think of it like a single model that you're putting into the game. The world generation will place chunks one at a time and use 2D Perl and noise to look up the height level for each stack of blocks. Afterwards, we just put some trees down on top and add a blue plane for the water, which creates a quite decent looking scene. Now for the focus of the video, shadows. The core idea for the lighting technique I'll use, which is called shadow mapping, is to render the world from the perspective of the light source. The geometry that the light can see must be in light and everything else must be in shadow. The idea is fundamentally simple but the implementation takes a little bit more thought. Since I'm using Python in modern GL, I have to do all the top-level rendering calls in Python while the GPU does most of the work through OpenGL. The way I tell the GPU what to do is using the OpenGL shading language, also known as GLSL. So let's start with talking about what a shader actually is. Fundamentally, they are programs that you run on your GPU. To write them when using OpenGL, like I mentioned, you use GLSL which kind of looks like C with a bunch of keywords. GPU programs will typically take in simple inputs and create simple outputs, but there will be thousands or even millions of instances running simultaneously. There are two main types of shaders that most projects will use. First, there are vertex shaders, which in our case take in individual points, the vertices of geometry, in 3D space and allow you to output a new point. These are used to move objects around, place things from the perspective of an arbitrary camera, etc. The second type of shader which this video will also focus on is the fragment shader. For each triangle you created through the geometry that just passed through the vertex shader, all the fragments, in our case pixels, that the triangle would contain are run through the fragment shader to determine an output color. That is, you get information about a pixel you want to render, and use whatever algorithm you'd like to select a color. The geometry information that you start with is the interpolation between points on the triangle being rendered. As a result, you can know where exactly in the world the geometry that your pixel represents is. When you run the vertex and fragment shaders to render a scene, the output gets saved as a two-dimensional image to something called a frame buffer. It's easiest in this case to just think of frame buffers as images. Anyways, when this rendering happens, OpenGL will keep track of which geometry is in front by saving the depth of each pixel it renders. If you have one triangle in front of another, the triangle in the back will not be visible since the depths are tracked during rendering. The side effect of this is that we can access this depth image created by the depth of each pixel. This is called the depth buffer and it's the key to generating shadows. As I mentioned, you can use vertex shaders to do things like render a scene from the perspective of a camera placed somewhere in the world. This camera placement is mathematically represented as a matrix. If you don't know linear algebra, just think of it as a bunch of numbers that can move, rotate, and scale our points in 3D space. They can do a lot more as well, but the transforms are the important part here. So now we can use our vertex shader to render the scene from the perspective of our light source, and get an image where each pixel has an associated depth. If you render the result, it actually looks super cool. I'm kind of tempted to make a game around this grayscale visual style, but I'm already juggling three projects at once. I don't need another one. 
the most important step is next. We must render the scene from the player's perspective and figure out whether the pixel the player sees is the same one that the light sees. The trick here is to have our main vertex shader generate two points instead of one. First, it needs to generate the points needed to render the geometry from the perspective of the player. But for the second, we make the vertex shader apply the lights matrix to get the points positioned from the perspective of the light. This means that once we get to the fragment shader, we now have the position and therefore the depth of each pixel from the perspective of the light that we rendered earlier on top of the information to render the pixel from the perspective of the player. All that's left is to check whether the light depth of the pixel is greater than what we had saved in our rendering from the light's perspective. Remember that the texture we got at the end only contains the depth for each pixel closest to the camera. So any pixel that the player sees with a calculated greater light depth from the perspective of the light source must be in shadow. With that comparison, we can just darken the pixel if we calculate it to be in shadow. And we have functioning shadows. Although you can see there's a lot of artifacts here. The fix for this is simple since these are just coming from imprecision. We just offset the shadow depth comparison with a bias value to account for the imprecision and poof, it's clean. Now the really cool thing here is that the light transform is arbitrary and can be dynamically changed to move the light source and consequently the shadows. As a result, we get some beautiful lighting. Adding more post-processing could make things look even nicer, similar to many of the real Minecraft shader mods, but that could be a whole extra video. All that said, our shadows are a bit jagged. You can see the pixels from the light's perspective along the edges. This is fortunately very easy to fix since you can just average out the shadow strength from sampling multiple points around the pixel in question. Now the shadows are nice and smooth. This technique is called percentage closer filtering or PCF for short. There are some super interesting tricks used in computer graphics, but shadow mapping has to be one of my favorites. The fundamentals needed to approach some of these concepts can be tricky to grasp, but this video's sponsor Brilliant is a great way to learn those fundamentals. Brilliant is where you can learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. It's designed to be uniquely effective by building from the ground up and allowing you to play with the concepts that you're learning. One of the foundational concepts in computer graphics is the humble vector. It can be used to represent points in space, movement, direction, and a load of other things. Brilliant has a great course on vectors where you can master the basic vector operations, work on your multidimensional problem solving, and even learn about their applications in games as you've seen in this video. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash the fluffy potato or use the link in the description. You also get 20% off an annual subscription. While this video is about shadow mapping, I have a lot more on this project coming. I'll be polishing up my code to essentially create my own engine, then I'll use the engine to start working on yet another game and doing the just add multiplayer part. I have some super cool stuff in mind, but Yana can pick cards are my main priorities for now. Anyways, thanks for watching.